KGRA Radio and Pop Culture Minefield presents Dangerous Military Nerds. Dangerous Military Nerds. They're just like regular nerds, only dangerous. And now, your hosts, Don Ecker and Gary Cassell. Oh, man. Oh, let me switch this. There we go. Is it Cassell or Kissel? I go by either one. I prefer Cassell because it's softer and doesn't sound like some kraut from you know, World War II. Either it, well, I, I, I've been calling you Kissel, so there it well, is. Well, that's hey. the New York that's the New York side of the family. I'm from the Pennsylvania side, and it's it's the two L's. So it's well, I'm softened. from Pennsylvania. That it's yeah, I'm Pennsylvania Deutsch. Um, Pennsylvania Deutsch. What the hell do you think Ecker is? I don't know. I thought it was like. Some, what do you think Brandenburg is? He can't one of those, more crowded. One of those that. lazy uh, Welsh names that didn't even know how to complete itself. <laughs> Actually, I, I had neighbors that when I lived in Florida at the Space Center. Yeah. The Space Center. Uh, my neighbors were named the Krauts. <laughs> the Krauts. <laughs> oh my God. And I'm really in the right neighborhood. Guy my grandfather, who served in the First World War, he never called them anything but Huns. <laughs> All he ever called him is goddamn the Bosch. Huns. The Bosch. The, the Bosch. Bosch. Well, look, today we got a real honest to Pete, dangerous military kind of show. We're going to be talking about nuclear weapons. We're going to be nuclear. talking about nuclear weapons that were apparently Detonated on the planet Mars, blew it right. right into Kingdom Apparently. Come. Apparently. John, stand by. I'll I'll tell you when to talk. <laughs> I've okay. got a video. I've got sure, a video. Don. Can I play the video? Sure, Sarge. <laughs> Don, can I go ahead so, and play the video? Yeah, in a sec. In a sec. Oh, okay. Today, our guest is Dr. John Brandenburg. An That's honest this guy. Pete. Real honest to God, rocket scientist, physicist. He not only worked for the Department of Defense, he worked for NASA. He was the administrative assistant to the director of the Clementine mission that went back to the moon in the mid 1990s. Of course, he wasn't allowed to see any of the then top secret pictures taken, but he was there. And today, we're going to be talking about a discovery he made while researching Mars. And that discovery included finding evidence of at least two airbursts of nuclear devices above the planet of Mars. John, welcome to Dangerous Military Nerds. I just had to jump in there, Gary. Kissel, on, man. I don't so mind. I could, I so do. I could, I could, uh, you know, I could get this uh, activity off to a flying start. To the, yeah, um, Delta Mike November, <laughs> <laughs> dangerous <laughs> military nerds. Uh, John, first of all, I want to play this video. That sure. now, the one that was on YouTube when I got it, I was afraid that it might have a copyright issue. Yeah. Uh, so I went ahead and changed it with friendly music from youtube um it's a little no it's not silly i was gonna make fun of you like play like whatever you want jerry <laughs> it's not though it's actually cinematic so uh, ladies and gentlemen we're going to be playing the video now that shows what john brandenburg discovered
it would seem Mars had a very bad day that day. Yes, that was well, uh, <clears throat> not a happy discovery, but a discovery. And I like that you show it in it, that it was clearly an intelligence that did it. I don't think there's any natural explanation for what happened. Yeah, because it wasn't a supernova. Now, I know that there are supposed to be... It wasn't a collision of neutron stars. It was, you know, there wouldn't be a Mars left. There wouldn't be a yeah. solar system left if that had happened. And I'm a plasma physicist working. I've been working on nuclear fusion for my entire career. And if we could get a solar flare to create these sorts of effects, we would have harnessed fusion a long time ago. But it's not. It can't be any of those things. So it only leaves one. Finally, as Sherlock Holmes says, if you rule out all the possibilities, the one Whatever that remains, is left. Yep. that must be However improbable. However improbable. And uh, so, yeah, the dog did not bark in this case. But it was a murder just the same. Um. And this, you know, this goes on with something we talked about today. Uh, and it was definitely in the chat earlier too. Uh, Monkey Jeebus, uh, one of our our members, <laughs> loves to talk about. I remember um, Monkey. Monkey's great, and he? he's awesome. He's right. He's a smart guy. Yeah, Monkey very Jeebus. sharp dude, man. He was talking about, you know, what I've talked about because I am one of those ancient alien theorists that believes in the seeding process, and wow. that you know that we may have been escapees from what happened to Mars. You know, well, it happened 180 million years ago. I don't think there's much a chance of that, but that's just my best estimate. I don't know. I don't know what happened actually. I have evidence for when it may have happened and what happened, but I don't know why it happened. Uh, it's just, it's just really amazing that it was that far back because I didn't realize how ancient it was when you were talking about the oh, first yeah. time. I'm like two million years ago. Like, oh no! It's a stop and think about how intelligent something has to be to do that, to travel. One hundred eighty million years. Ago. Well, we could do it if we had the, today. Uh, yeah, it, we we could do this. The Russians showed with their Tsar bomb that they could build a hydrogen bomb as big as you wanted. They just chained up from smaller hydrogen bombs to trigger bigger hydrogen bombs. They set off a 50 megaton one. It could have been 100 megatons if they'd added a uranium jacket to it. So that is not a question of feasibility at all. We could do this thing if we. Well, had let's let's resources. get something. Let's get something straight. It wasn't a case of murder, Gary. It was a case of genocide. Oh yeah, complete genocide. Yeah. It was a, of it was a massacre. Apparently, of a. Prim, what looks to what appears to have been a rather primitive humanoid culture, Stone Age, you know, the Old Kingdom Egypt, the Mayans, something like that. Crazy. Toltecs, Olmecs. It's uh, it was not a happy discovery, uh, but <clears throat> what makes me happy is that we can react to it. We can get well, our asses to Mars. <laughs> yeah, get your asses to Mars. Uh, a very, a very unusual thing happened, though, in about uh, 1983, 84. If you've been following for any length of time, the last 25 years, of the announcement that the United States government, the DOD, the DIA, the CIA, employed military remote viewers you know what that is, mm -hmm. projecting one's mind out for intelligence purposes. And we did it for over 20 years. We've got the receipts to prove it. The, the, the government each year renewed the remote viewing contracts. So they were getting something for the money. In 1984, thereabouts, the Central Intelligence Agency employed remote viewers to remotely view Mars about one million years ago. John, you and I have discussed this yes. on a number of occasions. What, what's your take on that? Well, it's my understanding that the remote viewing intelligence was right often enough 
and was corroborated by other intelligence sources that they decided that it was a part of our intelligence and the intelligence the remote viewers found uh, corroborates the picture I have just uh, depicted um, to a large degree. Um, I don't know. There's there's a number of differing details, uh, but that's that's okay. It's that's that's typical of raw intelligence. Now we also know that the headquarters for the independent Mars investigation team, which originally investigated uh, what looked like archaeology on Mars, the face and the pyramid at Cydonia Menza, and ultimately another face at Galaxis Chaos in Utopia, that the headquarters of that was at, was at SRI. I visited the Mars room there, and what I didn't know was just down the hall <laughs> was the remote viewing uh project at uh sri so they they would meet at the coffee machine and talk about what was what we were finding on mars and apparently this prompted the remote viewer people to look at mars and they found what appears to be corroboration so it's uh i i also uh suspect that the latest one of the latest missions to mars the insight probe which was launched from vandenberg meaning it had probably had a classified military payload they didn't launch it from cape canaveral they had to launch it from vandenberg which means they needed a bigger rocket it cost more and um, they landed a lander on mars to sample the soil and it's my belief let's say based on some things I've heard that they tested the soil and they found um, residue, isotopic residues indicating, yes, there were uh, big hydrogen bombs that went off on Mars. That's my understanding. Now, when I originally found this uh, data, um, we were investigating the face at Cydonia and uh, the pyramid there. And then we later, I later found the other uh, face at uh, Utopia, or now it's called Galaxis Chaos. Now, at that time, I was examining all of the Mars data, and I was a nuclear weapons scientist. I was working at Sandia National Labs. I spent nine and a half years in nuclear weapons labs, but I was working on fusion energy, the controlled fusion energy. But the, I worked down the hall sometimes from nuclear weapons guys. And one of them looked at the Mars isotopes and looked at the xenon-129 spike, which is very prominent. Uh, xenon-129 is very prominent in the Martian atmosphere, different from any other planet or, or uh, uh, meteoritic reservoir, the solar wind, anything like that. And he said, oh, someone nuked them. And then he looked at me. Like, oh no, I said something I shouldn't say because we were in an unclassified area. When he saw when he saw this, he then excused himself. And this happens sometimes at uh, weapons labs. You inadvertently blurt out something uh, that's based on classified knowledge that you shouldn't say in a certain unclassified area. And so he excused himself and walked into the classified through the door in the classified area. I never could talk to him again about it. But this prompted my investigation. I couldn't find evidence of the Xenon-129 spike in the open literature from nuclear weapons tests, but I did find it from supernova um, uh, simulations. Supernova and hydrogen bombs have the same physics. In the core of the supernova, you have intense uh, fusion neutron bombardment of heavy elements like uranium and thorium. And uh, thorium is another thing they can put in hydrogen bombs. They used it in the Amchatka device that they triggered in Alaska. But but what happens is the that fission process 
splitting of atoms with very high energy neutrons creates the xenon 129 spike. And this is seen clearly in simulations of uh, it, it seen in in uh, simulations of uh, pardon me of uh, uh, you know uh, a supernova and uh, and I've found that in the literature. So now it's basically proven. Now we found strong evidence that the entire surface of, of Mars was uh, then bombarded with uh, high energy neutrons. And it uh, was then, this creates uh, characteristic isotopes in the rocks, one of which is Krypton 80. The other one is it creates a lot of argon-40. Now, uh, when you set off a nuclear weapon in the atmosphere, it creates a lot of nitrogen-15. And that's very dangerous because it, when the neutrons from the nuclear explosion hit the normal isotope nitrogen-14, they convert it. They're absorbed. They're converted to the nitrogen-14 into nitrogen-15, and it emits a very powerful gamma ray so that the very atmosphere around you is bombarding you with deadly gamma rays. Um, if the neutrons and the gamma rays from the original explosion don't get you, the gamma rays generated by this neutron interaction with the atmospheric nitrogen will get you. So the nitrogen on Mars is heavily, it has double the number of nitrogen 15s, and it also has a spectacular overabundance of argon-40, both of which indicate heavy neutron bombardment. And both of those gases appeared at about, isotopes appeared about the same time on Mars, late in Mars history. Uh, so we, we have that this event, these events, these explosions happened late in Mars history, not at the very beginning. And there is no explanation, by the way, for these excessive xenon 129 that passes the uh, passes uh, scientific scrutiny that it's an inexplicable anomaly on mars and now the argon 40 and the xenon of uh, the nitrogen 15 basically uh, prove that that nitrogen that uh, this big neutron rich event a, a big nuclear explosion or apparently two of them happened on Mars and about 180 million years ago based on some irradiated rocks from Mars, the Mars meteorites. Now, well, let me, it, let me ask one yeah. quick question. One quick question, John. Sure. When, when we finally get there, astronauts, cosmonauts, is this re, uh, residue potentially going to affect the astronauts, no. cosmonauts no. adversely? No, the, 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 the radiation levels from this, event there are these events you know is is almost almost zero the more greater hazard for astronauts or cosmonauts or whoever on mars um, is cosmic rays because mars doesn't have a uh, magnetic field like the earth so there's no shielding from uh, you you spend most of your time underground on uh, mars or under a shielding magnetic field if you're going to have a when you have a permanent base so but if you map the gamma rays from space even though they're very weak they show two hot spots on mars in the north one is near cydonia menza where we found the face of the pyramid the other one is near um galaxis chaos where another face is found and then if you go around the planet just like in the video the shock waves would have converged on the far side of the planet and deposited a bunch of radioactive debris there. That's called an antipode deposit. It's on the exact opposite side of the average place where the nuclear shock waves from the two explosions would have met. And that is found in both potassium and thorium. Um, so we have a very strong case now that this happened. And 
Unfortunately, there is no natural explanation. These were air bursts, by the way. If you look at the two hot spots, there's no craters there. It's like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Something went off in midair and it didn't create a crater. It, in fact, at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they made the bombs go off in midair, several thousand feet above the surface in order to maximize shockwave damage and unfortunately maximize casualties. So uh, on Mars, the two things that happened in the north of Mars apparently were air bursts several kilometers above the surface. And um, so there's, there's no craters in the center of these hot spots. So this looks like a completely unnatural phenomenon. We're talking hydrogen bombs as big as the Empire State Building dropped from space and detonating kilometers above the surface. The shock waves wrapping themselves around the planet. The energy released was a that was 10 to 100 times greater than the Chicxulub impact that wiped out the dinosaurs. Only it happened to a planet half as large as Earth. So it would have completely changed Mars from being a planet like the Earth to being what it is now, almost lunar. So it's a, it's a sad thing to find, but we can react accordingly by accelerating our Mars program, send some rovers up there to the sites of the uh, impacts and sites of the archeology, span and get people, get boots on the ground. You have to, you could roll rovers around some of these sites for years and not see anything. You have to get trained eyes, people who can handle shovels and who are determined to find the secrets there. Boots on the ground. So in other words- now This is the plan. Get your ass to Mars. <laughs> yes, yes, precisely, precisely. Get your ass to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yes nice <clears throat> german accent yeah. <laughs> so uh don where do you want to lead us now on this well this is a uh when you think about it it's 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 so shocking in its revelations i i guess my next question would simply be okay if you're correct, 180 million to well, 200 million years. 200 million, ago, yeah. Round what numbers. does what does that <clears throat> mean to you and I and planet Earth today, John? Well, I would think that the people who did this, because I do not think this was a natural occurrence. Whoever did this is long gone, and the law of karma has caught up with them. But it shows you what other intelligence in this universe is capable of. In fact, I, I told one person, I said, I have not hypothesized anything happening on Mars that hasn't already happened on Earth. Life, intelligence, and mass murder using nuclear weapons. It's all happened on Earth. It just happened on Mars in a much larger scale. Now, we don't know if whoever did this might come back here. Now, there are two choices we have. We can become spacefaring. We can go up to Mars, find out everything we can about what happened. Who may have done this? Did the Martians know this? Who, who did this to them, etc.? Or we can wait and wait till they show up again and then form a space force and become space capable to try and stop them from doing this to Earth. That's your choice. We can either be proactive now, basically declare a Mars emergency, get boots on the ground on Mars as soon as possible to investigate this, exact, find out what exactly happened up there, is find out as much as we can it, our own, well, let me, allow our me own to, survival depends on it. Allow me to extrapolate a little bit. <clears throat> okay. 
I followed the search for SETI, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Oh yeah, going all the way back to Frank Drake when he when he uh, led the effort at Greenbanks, searching a couple of stars for evidence of an extraterrestrial radio transmission. Uh, and through all the years since then, including the discovery back in the 70s of the so-called wow signal, which was basically one off. Uh, the SETI astronomers did not accept it because they were not able to find a repeat of that transmission. But it was very unusual. It was and a wrong sure, number. <laughs> <laughs> there, there have been a couple of other oopsies in regards to a SETI signal. But I started thinking about this, John, <clears throat> and it's not simply, it's not all my, my thinking about this, but it has been astoundingly quiet out there. Now, that yes. can mean a couple of things. Number one, the alleged extraterrestrials have another means of communication that we yes. are not yet tuned into. Uh, on Star Trek, they had that uh, uh, type of communication. They were not radio. Exactly, they were not regular radio communications. Subspace which communication with relays. Yes. Yeah. But what if the other beings out there are keeping quiet because? they are aware of predatory races out there. Oh, exactly, Don. To, a true sign of intelligence in this universe may be to keep real quiet. Uh, obviously, we're failing that test. We're broadcasting our presence to everybody around here. Which is actually, if you think about it, potentially very terrifying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we have to get our asses in gear. Man up. Now, this is the plan. Get your ass to Mars. But here's the other thing. Exactly. If they, are, if they are coming from another star system, which obviously they, they would have to be. Yes. We're screwed anyway. We're Not having a hell of a prepared. hard time getting to the moon. Not if we're prepared. I mean, we got hydrogen bombs ourselves, you know? You know what I mean? I mean, uh, you don't have to be. I, I, I once saw a video of a wolverine taking on a grizzly bear because they were both fighting over a half-frozen elk carcass. And after a while, the grizzly bear, decided he just tore off a leg off the thing and decided this was too much trouble. So we got to become wolverines. And uh, if we are, we'll be too much trouble. Go Not Wolverines. worth the trouble. Of course, yes, that's, that's from, right. That's from Red uh, Red Dawn. <laughs> That'll make me happy. This will make me very happy if we react properly to this. Look, they could sit out there. They could sit out there in the solar system and throw asteroids at us. Well, we can destroy the asteroids with nuclear weapons. We have them. It's, it's really the dinosaurs did not have a space program, nor did they have nuclear weapons. That's <clears> why <throat> we are having that, this conversation. Well, that was part of the plot of Starship Troopers, by the way, if you remember that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, oh, there yeah. Are, there are many, many, many asteroids. We have a full belt of them. We don't have <laughs> not, near enough missiles. Uh, ladies to, and gentlemen, this is Martina Costa Santana. <laughs> the uh, manager of our chat and he's actually talking this show this is cool well what's we're we're fully capable of blowing ourselves up <laughs> so um you know um i think and i write science fiction under the pen name victor norgard and um i depict a war between us uh, I've depicted collapse of the of the uh, UFO cover up and uh, 
the resulting war with the Greys. It's really military science fiction, and um, that's kind. Uh, we are, and it turns out the human race is a Wolverine, and uh, even though they're uh, they're maybe outgunned in some ways, uh, they're they have enormous resources available, and uh, they apply them. It's uh, qu quantity has a quality all its own. We invade the moon. We take the moon bases on the far side. And um, uh, the grays are, after all, shorter than we are. So they get short with us, but we respond as humans have always responded. My, my, one of my favorite scenarios was uh, the Spanish had conquered old Mexico. And then they built ships and sailed across the Pacific. They conquered the Philippines in about two years. And then they heard about this very rich, they you know, they didn't find a lot of gold in the Philippines. So they were, they were unhappy. Uh, but they did hear about this very rich kingdom to the north called Japan. So they got the, the same guys. Miguel, get the muchachos into the boats. We're going up to Japan. We're going to claim it for the king of Spain and the Pope and everything. So they tried to land in Japan. And when they got there, <laughs> there were these bunch of guys on the beach waving, you know, their swords at them, you know, in the sun. And they realized, oh, my God, they got steel. <laughs> <laughs> and then a bunch of horsemen arrived, cavalry arrived, and then, oh, no, they got horses. And then the musketeers arrived. The samurai had gotten. Uh, gunpowder, <clears throat> uh, which they recognized immediately as a very valuable thing. They'd gotten it from the Portuguese, <laughs> the damn Portuguese, five years earlier. And every good samurai warlord had a team of musketeers and they could make the Japanese could make good steel. So the Spanish never even got into their boats. They realized, oh my God, we, this is not old Mexico which didn't have horses or metal or anything like that. Um, we can't do this. And what they could, I would love to see the note from the captains of those expeditions saying the Jap Japan, we tried to conquer Japan by force of arms, but the Japanese are too far away. <laughs> they're too advanced and they're too damn warlike. <laughs> They seem to really <laughs> relish war. <laughs> oh, they did, but they'd already defeated the Mongols twice. So yeah. the Spanish looked like nothing to them. And that's what the, uh, the Spanish then attempted to subvert Japanese culture by making them all good Catholics. But the Shogun figured that out. And uh, he announced on these islands that had become Catholic uh, and were then serving the uh, Spanish. He says, up. Oh, I'm officially changing you guys from being Catholics to being good uh, Japanese Shinto uh, or whatever it is, Good, Buddhist. Right. <laughs> All right. it, is there anybody who has, and then he would say, is there anybody who's got a problem with that in the audience? And being good Japanese, they said, uh, no. <laughs> in fact, there's no word in the Japanese. There was no word in the Japanese language for, for no. They just all said, hi. Yes. Yeah, yes. yes. Yes, whatever you say, Lord. I and, uh, <laughs> I understand completely. So they, uh, the Japanese went into isolation after that because the Spanish attempted to first directly conquer them. That didn't work. They then attempted to subvert their Japanese society. That didn't work either. Japanese went into isolation and um, didn't open up until we arrived. And... Uh, so Japan is a great example for us to follow. Now, the Japanese samurai on the beach, they did not have, they thought the earth was flat. <laughs> they didn't know anything about navigating the deep oceans. They didn't even have cannons. All they had was muskets, but they still deterred the Span The Spanish realized, oh my God, we'll lose everybody if we try and take these guys so, so this, like, that's a good example to follow 
So and if we like become like feudal that, feudal Japanese, I get you. Yeah, yeah. We're, we should be like the feudal Japanese and deter any attempts to try and destroy or conquer this place. If, if in fact, hostile aliens show up. Yeah, we, it's, I, we, I, the basic <laughs> idea is like we might not be able to beat you, but we're going to give you a licking. Oh, absolutely. And not only that, uh, Philip Corso in his book, uh, great book, The Day After Roswell, said that the reason the Soviet Union and the United States had so many nuclear weapons, far more than they needed to destroy each other 10 times over, was to deter any aliens whom both of both both governments, he said, were aware of their presence out there. They it basically wired Earth with nuclear weapons. So go ahead, <laughs> try and conquer us. You'll by the time we're done, we'll take as many of you as we can with you, as, as many of, and, and the Earth will be a radioactive wasteland, and it will all be for no good now. to anybody. There's no that. good to anybody. Yes, yes. Fly Scott. the fly in the buttermilk. The, the fly, fly in the butter. The aliens have shown they can neutralize nuclear weapons. They proved oh. it on several occasions. Uh, that's only the electronic systems. As I, in my novel, Morningstar Pass, which you can see a video synopsis of it on uh, YouTube. Third, the third edition is the most polished. So if if you, in the novel. The two heroines, one is this uh, beautiful Asian and one is this beautiful blonde. They're both news anchors, of course. And so they they demonstrate that you can make nuclear weapons that can be triggered by lighting a fuse with a lighter. <laughs> you don't need any fancy computers to trigger a nuclear weapon. Yeah, I tell you, All you need the concern, John, though, is proven time and time again that they even had impacts on the basic mechanics of old planes that flew by wire you know this is before technology oh, oh. So, well also there are many reports reports it, uh, on i one of the reasons i've concentrated on mars is there's data there in in ufology all we have don you know are reports we can't really be certain of any of them, any of them, a hundred percent. Now, so there's also many reports that the United States and the then Soviet Union shot down many alien craft. In fact, the, the Russians assumed anything flying, any unknown flying object over the Soviet Union was either American or British, <laughs> so they would scramble all their bigs roll out all their SAMs and fire away. They lost a whole bunch of MiGs. They lost a whole, you know, they fired a whole bunch of missiles, but they finally brought one down. They opened it up. The Interior Ministry troops arrived, opened it up with a Krobarsky, good Russian for Krobarsky. They looked in there and they said, Nyat <laughs> These people aren't Americans. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to uh, read one comment that I just saw that made me laugh on camera. It says by my buddy Zach's. Um, he says, uh, "I'm hoping <laughs> all these new genders will confuse the aliens." Oh well, <laughs> good. I hope it does. Uh, you good know Lord. the. Uh, we have a super chat from oh our friend super Christian chat from Christian Delorme. Oh yeah. Christian, yes Christian, from my son. Roll the panel. I'm not sure I understood that. It's got Roll. an accent over the O. Roll. What has the Canadian Army done about this? Oh, they've been really much, very much on the on the on target on this. The Canadian Army has been superb in this. <laughs> um, God bless Canada. We love the, our Canadian neighbors. We love our Canadian. Brothers. I pick. Yes. I poke at and them. sisters. <laughs> I do poke fun at them so much, but I do it out of love because I love Canada. Hey, my uh, boss is Canadian. And, uh, I have a lot of our, our panelists and on our show, and 
uh, are from Canada, and I just I love them. Oh yeah, no, no, I I, I grew up on the, in Oregon. Not we to mention of... they help us track Santa Claus. They do. Yeah, time. that's right. They do, and you know, and Trudeau he got in uh, old uh, the China, the PRC's his President Xi's face, and uh, said, "I'll leak whatever I want." <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Hey, before we move into the, the last part, yeah. before we go to our break, I do want to send a thank you out to everyone in the chat. Of course, Monkey, or as he goes by now, Colonizer Jeebus. Colonizer Jeebus. Love of my shouldn't life. That be and, settle, shouldn't that yeah. be Settler Jesus? Settler. Um, Anima Confusa. Lord Thoth. All hail, Lord Thoth. <laughs> Lord Game Thoth. Four. Yeah, Lord Thoth. Um, Dragon Ruse, Penny, who is also Dork Knight's mother, one of our uh, panelists. Uh, oh, he says, I know what the Canadian show. military is done. You'll like this. Um, coming in January, all of our shows on Pop Culture Minefield will be coming to uh, KGRA. And one of them is a new show uh, called Dork Side of the Ring on Sundays that is all about pro wrestling. And, uh, and of course, the host that is Dork Knight and Dr his mother is in our chat, Penny. Uh, did I say Dave Boar? I think so. Uh, let's see. Real Wave Nation. Parrot Head, who, who was making some snarky remarks about me and Martin, saying that I finally unmuted Martin. Did I unmute you, Martin? Uh, let's see. <laughs> Bribe Light is here, a good writer friend of mine, Justin T. Renee Cruz. Our. Muslim Uncle is here. Assalamu alaikum, Muslim Uncle. Good to see you, my friend. Timothy Mullins. Joe's Atmosphere is the co-host of the wrestling show on Sundays. Uh, and, of course, your friend, uh, Christian Delorme. Andy Morrow, a friend of uh, Dawn's. Zax, also known as Kyle. Uh, Eastland Burkholder. Magitech Mags, a good friend of mine. I invited her to come get in the chat tonight. And, of course... Uh, Chanel's reminding me our break is coming up, so I will um, make sure that uh, I, have, who's our I don't mess it up this week. <laughs> uh, and we have Snortopupus uh, Cubur. Snort what? What would you say? What would you say, Martin? I think we should hear from this person. Have mercy on me. <laughs> <laughs> Say it no, again. No. I could not understand you. <laughs> it's on the screen. Read it for yourself. No comprendo, amigo. Snort no poopus. Snort a poopus. Cuber. Actually, I know Snort a poopus. He's been on before. Good to see you. Um, by the way, for our super chat, because we're coming up on the. Hey, that's hey, it's... hey John's here. Hey, buddy. Um, he's our uh, host on Fridays. And oh. we're going to be. He and Keith are going to be talking about DC Comics and DC Cinematic, going into some detail of some of the things. Also, on our uh, Friday show, we're going to have none other than Mikey Sutton from Geekosity Mag. He's going to be talking about two scoops on our show. So we're going to be making uh, announcements. I don't know if it's Marvel, DC. He hasn't told me. I'm not allowed to know. He's like, nope, not going to tell you. So uh, stick around and watch our show. We have uh, gentlemen, super show. you old salts can lead my 22-year-old boy into battle anytime. <laughs> Just so you know, uh, Scott gets it. My buddy Scott, um, who's often on our shows, uh, he understands me now. I'm a combat medic. I take up the rear. Phrasing. I know. It's so funny. And been there, done that. No thanks. No thanks. <laughs> and for all my brothers and sisters in the military... Here's our little video for you. And thanks for the um, uh, super chat, Christian. Chap, chat, Christian. Here you go. Here's your little video. Boom. Here's your free cup of coffee from a lady in Rhode Island. What? <laughs> <laughs> I love that video. And for uh, John, I'm going to play one for you, buddy. It was just a dream. <laughs> um, we are we coming up another minutes, super right chat from oh super Christian. chat from Christian Delorme. Now, Christian, you were doing this last time. 
He is Signal Corps in the Canadian Army. We salute you. Um, uh, God bless him <laughs> for serving. Uh, there's nothing greater than to um, serve your country or to lay down your life for a brother or sister in arms. You know, I've always told people because so many will say, are you a romantic? I said, well, I'm romantic in the true sense of the word that uh, the Roman legionnaires uh, would are willing to lay down their lives for their fellow soldier, which is one of the truest forms of a romantic notion is self-sacrifice. So absolutely, I'm a romantic. <laughs> my Every... father and all my uncles on my mother's side were in the combat veterans of World War II. God bless them. Uh, United States, Canada, or? Oh, they were United States. United yeah. States. Army, Marines? Uh, my matters. father was in the Army Air Force, uh, and uh, my uncles were all drafted into the infantry. Uh, Grunts, gotcha. Yeah, one of them they was served in Battle Europe. of the Bulge, and yeah, they, Europe. Uh, you could tell he was a real combat veteran because he would never talk about it. Yeah. The only thing he remembered fondly was meeting the Russian troops at the River Elbe and the Russian troops handing out vodkas, vodka bottles to all the American troops. He, that was a fond memory. And that's the only thing he would say. He, uh, he was in Patton's army, uh, helped in the Battle of the Bulge. And then he, him and his buddies. That was third armor, him, right, Don? Uh, well, he was a forward artillery observer. Four, was, fourth. Fourth Armored fourth, Division. Fourth Armored Division. Yeah, he was he was in Third Army, which was uh, Patton's army. And then when he finished, they, him and his buddies finished the war in Europe. They were loaded on boats, put on train. And they landed in New York City, put on trains, and taken across the country. And informed they were going to be the leading uh, division to invade Japan. And they all thought they'd be dead men. And then they got to yeah, Sacramento. That was and some the, crazy warfare in Japan. Oh, the, oh, they, the they, the, the, the Japanese were determined to fight to the last man, and and he, they stopped the uh, train in Sacramento. Sergeants told him, uh, if you got him, smoke him, get out, and if you got him, smoke him. And so they then they heard that the nuclear weapon had been dropped on Hiroshima, and they said, we think the war will be over in a few days. And they were yeah, so and, relieved. And people act like this was something that we came to idly. And it's like, no, if you no. know what was going on, the Japanese were acting like they were going to surrender, but they weren't. Uh, and uh, MacArthur reported that they were uh, building up forces in the mountains, including building launching fields out of caves. Yes. yes. And they said, if they prolong this war, millions are going to die and we're going to kill millions of them. Oh. And so they 10 million to, Japanese civilians would have died. Easily have died. Have, and probably the north of Japan would have become occupied by the Soviets. Definitely. They would have invaded Japan in the north. See, that, so that was the other thing. The Russians were coming in, finally. Oh, yeah. Mm. The Russians and, had already mm. taken over Manchuria. Even as Korea. it was, Stalin let them go on for a week after the Japanese fell back. Yes. Yeah, and, and a lot of people don't know this, that there were actually a lot of Catholic missionaries that were killed in both those bombings. And uh, yes. this was a strategic decision that was made was terrible. not lightly. They knew oh, how no. awful it was. And it I was guarantee terrible. you Truman took that to his grave as, as something that he could never probably ever really let go of. Who could? Well, they uh, say he uh, met Oppenheimer, the head of the Manhattan Project in Oppenheimer was very depressed and said, I feel like I it was have a good commie, by the way. <laughs> I know. And Truman, its characteristic frankness, said, What do you feel bad about? My hands are a lot bloodier than yours. I ordered you made you built the bomb. I dropped it. He said. That's right. And he said, and then he said to his aides, get this guy out of here. I don't want him to see ever see him again. Yeah, well, he was a self-aggrandizing dude. I mean, it, I mean, don't get me wrong. Great scientist, self-aggrandizing. Great scientist. Yeah, but uh, and a also, commie, and a commie, and a commie. We um, have this. We have this. Hey, we can't all be perfect, you know. I received news say that a soldier, a true brother, someone I have known for twenty-five yeah. years, fellow major in the Canadian Airborne, today died of cancer. F cancer. You damn right, F cancer. 
I am heartbroken. And in fact, I'm going to throw my one F bomb for this show. Fuck cancer. And, uh, but for all the veterans out there, especially all my Vietnam war buddies, here you go. This one's for you. You got any good stories I could tell them about how cool Nam is? You know, there's lots of things you expect in war. Carnage, the sleepless nights. But what they don't prepare you for is the incessant use of fortunate sun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, in my, uh, it, I write science fiction and I made sure to put a Canadian special forces guy in my first novel, which was uh, 2012, uh, asteroid 2012 Sepulveda. So I have a not only a Canadian airborne guy, but also a bounty. This is in the middle of the action, and, to and, get they, back and into they are and they are very heroic, both of them. God to get bless back into him. the good mood, that's oh. Wolfram breached the do the back door. Back door, <sighs> likes the back. Damn and you, This John. is my this is my dog Bailey, who <laughs> is ready to fight <laughs> any damn commie. Absolutely, or the alien predatory aliens just show up. And for our backdoor breakage, here is your song. Open your back door, baby. Loosen your hinges. I'll show you my key. Yeah, baby. Odd how much like a so we've gone from nuclear like, weapons being employed uh, on bars to uh, discussions uh, of the back door. Welcome to 80 Theater. Jeebus, I'll never good. Good. I like that. Not this Jeebus is ADD has been theater. Um, we're getting ready to move into our thing here. Uh Let's wrap up in uh, uh, three minutes, under three minutes. Um, Don or John, you want to uh, mention something at this point uh, about Mars before we go to break that you well, think is important? <clears throat> Mars is a hell of a place that, to raise your Especially that kid. may have fact up <laughs> today. Yes. There. Oh, hmm. We should get our ass to Mars, find out what the hell happened up there as yep. much as possible. Amen. And become spacefaring in the meantime. Why take the risk? Start moving towards actual Star Trek. Um, Absolutely. Although I, I don't think we'll ever be benign. Uh, government. You know the human race needs, better than that. Greed, power. But the oh. fact is, I do know that out of all of that, we have had some amazing scientists and astronaut explorers in our oh. history who have done amazing things. Despite None of my that work crap. would have been possible without the very hard work of a bunch of very serious scientists and technologists and engineers. Amen. On they that. supplied all the data I'm using. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm just doing my job to defend this country, to seek its well-being and that of the human race as a whole. And the further survival. I'm just doing my job. And for, yeah. Oh, it, survival would be a good thing for the human race. Number one. <laughs> It's, it's yeah. like um, we're going to create like you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We're, we're going to create Brandenburg's <laughs> hierarchy of needs. <laughs> Keith, first survival, second survival, uh, uh, third Keith is uh, in the prosperity. Chat. Yep, prosperity. Um, the right to seek happiness. It's not guaranteed you'll get happiness, but to seek happiness. Uh, life, liberty, and, and the right pursuit of to pursue to pursue happiness, and uh, and I find in life that happiness is fleeting. Satisfaction is far more rewarding for me, <laughs> and I've had a lot of satisfaction in this life. Here uh, we go back to uh, the previous discussions. Humans are going to Mars. Oh well, there goes the neighborhood. neighborhood. I'm sorry, yeah, you must have read my science fiction. <laughs> It's like humans are, are are the neighbor that puts a toilet out for flowers in the yard. That's what in humans my, are. <laughs> in my science fiction, I write under the name Victor, pen name Victor Norgard to separate it from my science. Uh, the human race cannot stay out of trouble. It just <laughs> doesn't yeah, really go looking for trouble, but trouble finds it. Finds it. Anyway. Get overly excited and, and don't consider the implications. Uh, it's happened many times. You know, well, and, uh, all I did was play my stereo loud. I hate to and, interrupt. I think we only have time for we'll this. do this. No, there's no time for yep. this. We're going to do that afterward. Um, the show is yours, Chanel. Uh, do your thing, baby. Yeah. Anytime. Hi, guys. This is Gary from Pop Culture Minefield here on KGRA, and we're leaving for our first break. I hope we survive. Hey, members. 
The new KGRA DB app is now available on iOS and Android devices. Gain on demand access to any KGRA DB programming. Download any show directly to your mobile device to listen or watch on the go. Go to the App Store and search KGRA DB. You're listening to the KGRA Digital Broadcasting Network. We provide unparalleled coverage of trending news in the world of ufology, cryptozoology, and paranormal phenomenon. Whether you're watching our video live stream or listening to one of our audio programs, you are getting the best from world-renowned researchers and hosts guiding you through topics the mainstream won't touch. Miss one of your favorite programs? No problem. Head over to the members area at KGRADB.com for access to our massive library of award-winning content. Make contact, stay connected, only at KGRADB.com. Oh, wow, we survived. Welcome back from the commercial break. Now for some more pop culture minefield on KGRA. I said, well, so Gary's stupid. still doing good, buddy. Still, still doing good. <laughs> I said, great show. Great show, Gary. By the way, I uh, enjoyed it. Go, honor I realized and pleasure. that's Bill in the first promo. I'm like, hey, that's Bill. You can tell because he's got that, uh, you know, New York accent. How you doing? Sure, Bill. <laughs> yeah, I should have recognized him, you know? Um, welcome back. Um, I just sound really so, like, mentally handicapped in those little intro and outros, but I, they're funny to me. I laugh at myself. Um, I, I sound so yeah. dumb. We won't uh, tell anybody, though, Gary. <laughs> No. I could count to potato. <laughs> <laughs> Christian DeLorme, thank you for a $5 super chat. Uh, I'm from a great Canadian military family. I am happy my boy is in the Canadian Army, can look up to you Yanks. Uh, we look across at each other. We respect all of our fellow soldiers. Absolutely, um, we do. To all of our allied countries, we, we respect them so much. Canadians came ashore with us on D-Day. We all will never forget that as Americans. Uh, Jimmy Doohan from Star Trek, Scotty, Canadian, got his butt shot off and lost a finger. Sure. That was uh, that was D-Day, not Anzio, right? That was D-Day. That was D-Day. No, that, yeah. that was D-Day. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, man, uh, other than us, the Canadians really got it the worst. Um, uh, it's like those two beaches, it was, Ju what was it, Juno? Um, and Sword. And Sword. And yeah. the British, the angle the British went in was bad, but nothing compared to what Canada and the United States. No, no, no. And, and uh, uh, we went straight into those bunkered machine gun thing. Oh my God, it was just Omaha, brutal. Omaha, and Utah. Omaha, Utah yeah. was not nearly as bad. No, but um, and then even in the there? fighting, even in the fighting inland, uh, the uh, 
Canadians and the SS develop a special hatred for each other. And uh, so, <laughs> well, it, well, the SS it, executed it things, a bunch of Canadian prisoners. Happened. Yes, they did. And then the Canadians responded. It in is kind. reported. It is reported. They responded in kind. So the SS were afraid to say. Well, it's like to those to any Nazi members. bastards at Malmendy executed oh, yeah. close to 100 surrendered American uh, soldiers. Yeah, I mean, we did it too, but nothing to the extreme of other countries. Well, and SS weren't too accepting of American hospitality after Malmendy, believe me. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, and the Canadians landed at Dieppe, which was a failed experiment. We understand that. It was, uh, it was terrible, but, but we learned from that not to land at Dieppe. We got to land on oh. the beaches. Another $5 super chat from Christian DeLorme. You are singularly supporting this entire show right now. <laughs> Christian, God bless you. You're such a wonderful person. Uh, Keith! Another super chat, and she says, uh, I'm saying Christian. I don't know if that's a, is that a lady or a man? I don't know. You guys know, because I, I hate, uh, you know, assuming. Uh, but Juno Beach was big, but my great uncles were in Ortano, Italy. Ouch. That yeah. was rough. Yeah, my one uncle lost his, all his hearing. He was a machine gunner in Italy, came back from the war, no no sense of, well, he had to wear a superpowered hearing aid, so we couldn't talk much. Yeah, I got to tell you. Now, Christian, for your video, you get this because it's the middle. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the middle of the film. There you go. <laughs> Monty Python. <laughs> oh, man. Uh Oh, well, you know, I talked to Don about this. I tried to join MUFON back in the 90s. And the person I spoke to was so rude to me that I, I didn't join uh, here in Missouri. I really wanted to join MUFON and go out and do research and stuff. And uh, it's like funny, man. I may have found them on the wrong day. I don't know. but uh, Well, you, you had a MUFON drone. I was insulted by the international director of MUFON. <laughs> I was insulted by a drone. <laughs> God bless, God bless you, Don. Um, All right. So, Keith, what do you do? What how, What's your role in this great uh, fiasco? You know what? I'm I'm more of the dedicated info nerd slash. Sure. Um, I'm 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 more of the info nerd slash uh, historian slash uh, seemingly nice guy. Uh, and 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 very appreciative member of the group. Yes, he's so. an HNC head nerd well, in charge. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're here. I'm sorry, and, but as uh, funny as that sounded, you sir are a racist. <laughs> uh, Keith is why I got uh, into doing this. I yeah. wouldn't have done this. <laughs> oh, well. It's an honor to be on here with you. It's an honor, really, to be on with all of you. So, very good. Uh, Thank you. You got Thank any questions you. for John? Look, um, seriously, what, in your opinion, would be the top three things that you think we must do before we get to Mars? I mean, just the top three things we must do. Okay, is this part of the Brandenburg hierarchy of needs? Should we include that? <laughs> Go well, for it, John. I, I, I think, well, look, we've already done one of them. We've launched that big SLS rocket, which performed flawlessly. We've tested the Orion capsule. We have space station modules, which we could just send to Mars if we had the appropriate upper stage for the SLS. Now, what we need is a good upper stage for the SLS with very high exhaust velocity, high specific impulse. And I have, as is, is it just so happens, I am the inventor of the microwave electrothermal thruster running on water vapor. We get 900 seconds ISP. It's as good as nuclear thermal. We can have people, especially my, my goal is to put people on Phobos, establish a base camp, go down to the surface from Phobos, and we can have them... Uh, I mean, the development time for a 
rocket that will take upper stage that will take people to and cargo to Mars using this uh, MET thruster, which just uses big solar power panels mm -hmm. and water. We all know about water that, you know, it's not explosive. It's not flammable. It's very easy to transfer in space and very easy to store in space. You could literally put the satellite up, the, the, the transfer module up in space, and then send up a, uh, you know, 30 tons of water on a uh, Falcon Super Heavy and transfer the water into the tanks of this thing. But the SLS can be upgraded with an upper stage to take people to Mars now using this. Uh, I, by the way, I've tested a 75 kilowatt version of this thruster. The, the wa running on water vapor, it sent a blue white beam of plasma out into the room. It looked just like the lightsaber from Star Wars. Ooh, wow. And it would cut metal. This thing is a super rocket. Can we weaponize that? <laughs> we got no we can't it's, it only goes out a few feet in the air but but anyway what we can do with it is a cluster of those can send large amounts of cargo and people to mars very with minimum of development time we don't need to develop nuclear rockets or figure out how to transfer liquid hydrogen john let me ask space. you this yeah would yeah, that rocket fun. would that rocket actually land on mars or no 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 would you need a shuttle well actually to land on mars all you need is a heat shield and then uh some you know katusha rockets from the russians to do a break you know you don't you don't need we all, we all can already land stuff on mars very easily of ton weight and, and, so keith what do you think of that oh, upper stage man. solar electric yeah love it love it i okay. mean it brings it brings to mind another question once you're done. Sure, sure. I mean, uh, well, uh, before I mean, we go there, before yeah. we go there, we have a super chat from Christine Delorme, five dollar Canadian. I'm a big burly Canadian. Is that what driver. that stands for? Can it, I thought that's California five five bucks. <laughs> yeah, can, it's Canadian. <laughs> Canuck. I grew up in um, Oregon. I got powerful feelings about California. I, I, I always re joking refer to it as monopoly money, Canadian money, but um, <laughs> it is, it spins, it spins. So it's definitely bad. not a she. Okay. Thank you. And relax. This, this is Canadian money. Yeah. Okay. Thank Goodbye. you. What's the, and that one is following, followed by this one. Oh, another one. So two, I get to play a vi uh, two videos. Uh, and thank you for saying uh, dip. We Canadians appreciate it. it was a blueprint to D Day. Yes, it, it was. was. It was uh, basically what everything that went wrong avoid for <laughs> D Day. Right. And for you, you get this special UFA UFO Day uh, video. Do you believe any of this voodoo bullshit, Blair? Kyle, Charles, chariots the gods, man. They practically own South America. I mean, they taught the Incas everything they know. Boom, baby. Uh, thank you. <laughs> there so you go. The, the word of authority. Yep. Uh, I got to tell you, man, uh, one of my favorite alien invasion movies is uh, the 1982 John Carpenter, The Thing. And I love the original, too, from 1950. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the original and the, uh, and you could tell they were well informed. No, no, no. Complete it, with animal mutilations, you know. Oh, my gosh, yeah. And I heard that Wilford Brimley used to be a rancher, and he relished the scene of playing with the the fake dead body with hooves and paws and faces, oh, he just got into this it. This is the eighty two version. Yeah, the eighty two yeah, version, version. version. Properly grotesque, according to the original. You know. Yeah. The now the original story. film, based off of uh, Joseph Campbell's, uh, or not Joseph Campbell's. Uh, oh, what's his name? Campbell. Uh, something Campbell. Uh, it was Who Goes There, and yeah. in the movie, the original movie. Uh, it was actually a longer script, and the alien thing was supposed to be squid-like, have tentacles and everything. And uh, the producer of it s made westerns. He says nobody wants to see that; they want to see a giant monster, a human. You know, Matt so Dillon. They, Matt Dillon, J James Arness got put in the makeup. On top of that, when they fired Christian Nyby, who went on to work on Perry Mason instead. Um, they took the script, his shooting script, and he tore it in half. Winchester Film Zoner, I can't think of his name right now, 
uh, famous for making like his girl Friday. I can't think of his name. Uh, he took the script and tore it in half and threw the second half of the script out. And he goes, this is our movie. Find an ending. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy that that movie ever got made. And it's the first alien invasion film. A lot of people don't know. It was. That. It was a good movie, though. Uh, <laughs> Watch this, guys. Of, at the end of the movie, he says it over the radio. Especially in light of what, what is reported now. Yeah, because Margaret Sheridan, window. who played the assistant to the to the chief scientist there, I still to this day find her one of the most oh, fetching, uh, sexy ab person, people, women ever. She I was ever, delightful in that. Oh, she was. It was a great movie. Great and I got to tell you, one of the things that lit up the screen the was her. Yeah, what was so good about that film, Howard Hawks. Hawks did the same thing in that film he did in a lot of his movies, His Girl Friday, all those films. He liked overlap dialogue where people begin to talk over each other. Sure. And it's it's more realistic, more believable. And hey, they were Gary, still... Gary, that happens. People talk over each other. Yeah. You know. And uh, but they were still kind of using just as it hadn't <laughs> left yet. There was sometime we're using that North Atlantic accent. The way they do films, because they definitely used it in His Girl Friday, and and it still kind of played heavy in how Hawks pushed the dialogue for uh, the original thing from Another World. But it is a classic film. It absolutely had one of the scariest moments. My dad, who went to see it the opening weekend, uh, he said, "I still don't know what scared me more when they open that door and you're not expecting James Arness there, but you kind of expect him, but then he's there." And that arm comes out, and it's the big shocking moment of, of the movie. And he says, or if it was all the screams from the girls in the theater that made me jump. Because he said it just horrified him. He got <laughs> left out of his skin for that moment. And I just, I love that movie. It's a classic. And like I said, uh, you know, it was the first alien invasion film. And how close was this to the DC thing, Don? <clears throat> I'm not sure I understand. What do you mean, how close? Was it before or after the incident in D.C., the three uh, days? Oh, before. It was before. So that's, but, that's but amazing. Could, uh, the, the UFO phenomenon had become very much front page news. Oh, Roswell, uh, Kenneth Arnold. Um, you know, we're, that, we're actually our first episode today, UFO Wednesday. That's what we talked about was the- Donald Kehoe was, was at the top of the game then. Absolutely. Yeah. His book, his book had just been released. And Kehoe and, was uh, the one that went on TV, right? With um uh Dan Rather. Mike Wallace. Or Mike Wallace, that piece of shit. Whoops, that slipped out of my mouth. I'm so sorry. Um call me craphead. Oh, I, I don't know what you're talking about, Gary. <laughs> Don, do you know what he's talking about? I think I have a clue. Yeah, I don't like I'm looking Dan for Rather. a vow, but I think I got a clue. <laughs> Uh, there's a U in it, and it may begin with an F. <laughs> so, um, the I love your color colorful metaphors there, Gary. Yes, Star Trek. Yeah, uh, I've noticed that you begin to. What was the line from Spock in that, Keith? Where he says uh, that you've been using a lot more colorful metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> You know, double dumbass on you. Double dumbass. <laughs> I never heard that one. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. I love that movie so much. Um, and if nobody follows William Shatner on Twitter, you are missing the greatest thing that's ever happened in Twitterdom. Is William Shatner, a guy that's, what, 90 now? Um, shitting on young people. Just absolutely <laughs> shitting on them. They'll say something. And I refer to it as hashtag shatting on uh because he sh he's shatner shatting and it's it's perfect why isn't this a thing <laughs> i've been trying for over a year two years trying to get hashtag shatting on he, i love he, the way he does it he's what, 91 does he? as 91. of this past march 91 years old my god i hope i live that old and that oh. man went to space, space for real in the 80s yeah he did he went and did it. He showed now, what could be done. Stone cold balls on that guy. Stone cold. Yep. And, you know, he's he's already told everybody he's got uh, some kind of lung problem, so he has to sleep with a 
The CPAP. Uh, the CPAP. Yep. And, you know, which is a very frank admission, and but he looks very healthy mm-hmm. and certainly has a very positive outlook on life. And Absolutely. we all and- admire that. Keith, and I, gotta, I hope we all live to be 91. God, yeah. <laughs> In fact, I made the proclamation, I think about 15, 20 years ago, I said, I don't want to live in the world without Shatner. I hope he outlives me. Because <laughs> I love having him in this world so much. Well, one of my favorite things was him kissing uh, Lieutenant Uhura. And he didn't, we really. Suspe- we all suspected he, they had a thing going. They actually never connected <laughs> lips. Uh, oh. And you were supposed to catch that, that he was, re- they were both resisting because they were but, being forced to kiss. Oh, oh yeah. Well, I still had a crush on her anyway. Oh yeah. Who did here, here I'm in, growing up in a lily white town. And I have this guy right here her. met her. Ah, oh, very yeah. good. She, Michelle, she was, Michelle Nichols was, a. have met every single member of the original cast. With wow. The exception of D. Forrest Kelly. So. I got to play a Star Trek trivia game with uh, Jimmy Doohan. And (laughs) it was, I love that man. I loved him and he beat me. And, uh, but what I I noticed about him was the permeation of of booze through his pores because you could smell it on him. That guy was a drinker. But my God, that guy knows Star Trek inside and out and absolutely crushed me playing um, uh, Star Trek trivia on a local radio station up there in uh, Seattle. But um, did I see something? I thought I saw something a minute ago. Oh, Krampus is here. Hi, Krampus. Oh, good. We got to... Who else dropped where, in? Where exactly is your cramp, Jeebus? <laughs> He's got it in his monkey. You know, you get brand muffins. Brand muffins will help with that. I, I do have... I do have way, my other my other uh, crush was uh, not Nurse Chapel. I liked her, but was Raquel Welch at the time, whom I thought oh, was wow. uh, By the way, Lord Thoth, that was from Shatner. That was something he said, that well, they Nichols never says, actually connected lips. Oh, uh, they obviously well. connected lips, for heaven's sake, so they enjoyed <laughs> it. I could see that. I wrote a spoof. Well, whatever helps you sleep at night, bitch. Star Trek once uh, called the uh, journey to bamboozle instead of journey bamboozle. To <laughs> the planet and bamboozle. I had, I, I had, uh, she, I had Was Captain Don King and to her getting together in the elevator. <laughs> hey, John, well, I'll was, tell you was, who did connect lips. And that was Roddenberry and her. Oh yeah. Oh uh, yeah. He and I talked about that, that, um, you know, he slept with three of the major ladies on the show. Um, well, first his wife, and then Madgell and Nichelle Nichols. And I don't know if I think Nichelle was before Madgell Barrett, and then mm-hmm. Madgell. Yeah. And uh, I met her. I, I met her in, in uh what's her name that played De- Deanna Troy. Um, just a delightful moment uh, meeting them and talking. Was, I was at a Star Trek convention with my Star Trek art that I did for uh, it was official artwork, and uh, I was just so excited to get to meet you know the voice of the computer. And the, guy, the, yeah. chick, the chick that had kids with, with uh, you know, the creative I, I was so inspired by that first Star Trek. Uh, and what do you know? Oh, yeah. thing. Christian Delorme is giving us another super chat. Oh, $5. Thank you. Uh, regardless what my Canadian NCO says, Yanks are cool. <laughs> well, um, it's, I, I think that I'm surprised they put up with us, you know. <laughs> most, they're good. Most, they're good. Uh, by the way, most people think of Canada as what the United States could have been if things were run in a more orderly, hopefully and, without uh, Trudeau. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and uh, for your your five dollar super chat, you get this little wonderful moment from cinema history: human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Yeah, baby, Bill Murray, a living legend. He's legend. Wait for it, Airy. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> well, the story. By the way, the story I heard was that when Quebec was going through one of its uh, attempts at separation from the rest of the Canada, the, the Party Quebec, uh, they delegates from um, British Columbia and uh, I believe it was Alberta or Saskatchewan came to visit Ronald Reagan and asked. Can we join the United States if 
Canada breaks up, you know. And he said, he said to them basically, will you guys get your shit together up there? <laughs> he says, you wouldn't be happy in this country. Believe me. He says, go back up there and get this shit squared away. Yeah. And of course they did. They, uh, you know, the party of Quebec lost in the election and they've been bitter about it. You know, one of the gaming, one of the gaming companies, it might've been, strategy and tactics i forget i i was really into it back in the day but when all that problem was happening between the french canadians and the british canadians one of those gaming companies came out with a game where they had a civil war in canada yes and canada got really upset about that they were really do you do you guys recall that no, I don't, but I'm going to be looking it up after the show to see if I can play it. <laughs> well, in my, in my novel about the big asteroid shoot em up Canada does have a civil war. It lasts about two weeks. And, uh, you know, that's why I have the Mountie and the Canadian airborne guy. And um, it's, it's, it's really bad. And uh, especially because of the fighting up north between the Native Americans and the Party Quebec people. And uh, but what I did is I studied Canadian history. I actually found out they sort of had four civil wars as opposed to just one that we had. Oh, if you look at pictures, you know, the, the British were in charge. So the Canadians say, oh, it wasn't our, it, it wasn't really a Canadian civil war because it was a British colony. But if you look at if you look up at uh, War of uh, 1837 in Canada, you'll see pictures look just like the American Civil War. Long lines of people blasting away at each other from 30 yards apart. And in the background, burning buildings with people jumping out of windows into the snow. There's another thing of a bunch of people jumping out of windows to the snow and being bayoneted by either British or yeah. Canadian militia so <laughs> being canadians they don't talk about these things but well let's not let's not forget our history <clears throat> back in the in the mid 18th century along about 1756 or 7 yeah. the french indian war began here by french coming down into what is north of, well down into what today is the united states those but with their friends. Indian allies wiping out colony colonies along the frontier, American That's colonies. Right. One of the most vicious wars that America ever fought, including yeah, the Civil War. Yep. Oh, well, it the, was vicious. The Canadian, uh, the French, French, uh, French and Indian Wars showed the Americans that the British Army was not invincible. Braddock's defeat. Oh my God! Uh, was just and, such and a massacre of the British, but the Americans militia who was there? under uh, George George Washington, Washington was, was there. He in fact started the whole. He in fact started the French and Indian War. He started his, the war. Much to a lot of people chagrin. don't realize that he and the party he was they were going to what was Fort became Fort Duquesne. Yeah, and uh, his party. I don't know if it was actually they Washington or one of his guys shot and killed a French diplomat. Well, he was and, uh, called a diplomat by the French. It may have been just a French ra French and Indian raiding party. We don't know. Well, that was the excuse. Reports reports are a little shaky from that time. <laughs> we don't, exactly. They didn't have the internet to, to give us truly reliable information. Hey, eh, Keith? <laughs> um, unlike, reporting unlike, live from, you know, 1759. <laughs> Keith, Hey, Keith, how is it there in revolutionary times? Um, I, 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 I can't understand it. I mean, all, all I know is I got people trying to whip me to get back to work. So, <laughs> Well, uh, as somebody who has uh, a few lash marks myself, I understand that. Um, but it's, uh, you know, the, the French and Indian Wars convinced the uh, American colonists that the British Army was not invincible. Uh, having seen them break and run on numerous occasions. And uh, the Americans, militia, really learned how to fight. Well, the in American the Indians taught us, you know, how oh, oh, to oh. do guerrilla warfare. 
And oh, well, I want to my... point out too that the War of 1812 got started because some knuckleheads in DC said, let's invade Canada and make it our northernmost state or whatever. <laughs> and it's like, I, that was the craziest thing. But I always say that war was necessary because the Revolutionary War got us our liberty, but we didn't earn respect from Britain and King George until we kicked his ass during the War of 1812. It's true. It's true. Well, actually, and, we didn't do much ass kicking until after the war was over. The after the Official. war of it. <laughs> New yeah. Orleans. New Orleans. Typical well, screw Colonel up Jackson, war. Colonel Jackson down there, 1814, took a little trip along with Colonel Jackson down the mighty Mississippi. I yep. took a little bacon. Hey, and I took some beans. And I fought the bloody British in the town of New Orleans. I sang we that fired song our in guns, and the British I, kept I it coming. John, British and we kept fired coming. once more, and they begin to run him. That's yes. right. Down to Mississippi, it was, the Gulf of Mexico. Those were <laughs> veterans, by the way, of fighting. We have Napoleon. another super chat. Oh, Christian says, um, gentlemen, uh, countries aside, you men stood true and tall. Oh, somebody said somebody about. said something nice about uh, my comment I always about talk Canada nice about having having its own interesting history that they never talk about. Uh, well, I'll, I got to tell you, I, they stopped us in our invasion attempt. <laughs> Oh, I know. They they fought very they well. Dead they in fought our very tracks. hard, and they stopped they stopped the Americans from uh, trying to invade Canada, which I'm very grateful for. They're like, sorry, mate. By the uh, way, Canada would be fa Canada would be a fabulous place, even if it wasn't our northern neighbor. <laughs> Amen to that. And um, uh, but yes, uh, Christian, thank you again for your super chat. Oh my gosh, I'm almost running out of videos. Here you go. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. What are you? I'm Batman. I'm Batman. <laughs> um, well, I, I got to tell you, um, I love talking military history. I may not, I don't always know everything, but I have a good working knowledge of a lot of it because my dad was, well, a teacher of history. And, uh, and he raised me in colonial Fredericksburg. Because so many battles were fought there from revolutionary to civil war. Yeah. And uh, it was the center of a lot of things. It was uh, a lot of shipping was done through Fredericksburg back in the day. Um, yeah. it, you know, up the Rappahannock from the Potomac. And it's a wonderful state. I, I love Virginia. It's beautiful. I'd go back, but that state's not big enough for me and my ex-wife. So um, I miss Virginia. It's beautiful. Have you been there? Have you ever been there, John? Oh, I used to live in Virginia. I lived, what part? Uh, oh, northern. I, I was working around the Beltway. I was a Beltway Buccaneer. Okay. Uh, around. I lived Beltway. in Fredericksburg. You know where it is. During the Reagan arms build up in the Cold War. Yep. You know where Fredericksburg is. It's 50 miles south. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a nice place. Nice place. Yeah, it's like a lot of people commute from Fredericksburg in the Stafford area to D.C. Yeah, it's a the nice commute place to gets live. pretty rough during the winter, by the way. Um, the Beltway, I'm bridge. telling you. I have there's only three places where I've seen traffic worse, and one of them is on the uh, 405 um, in um, California, Northern California. I was going to mention that. Yep. <laughs> when I was going from, it was fine in the morning heading from uh, uh, Sacramento all the way to the Bay, but on that trip home, it was like bumper to bumper, just moving, <laughs> edging through. And I'm like, oh my god, why am I doing this job? It's killing me. This traffic is killing me. Um, but know. oh, Magitech Mags, Canadian Civil War. Sorry, a. Eh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, Magitech we're sorry Mags. about that. It, you know, it's in Wikipedia though. Just look up uh, War uh, Revolt of eight, 1837 in Canada, and you'll see pictures of them. And, and according to the British, oh, about well, a dozen people were killed. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, Magitech for you. I have a special video. Keith loves it. It's his favorite video. You don't deserve your family. Who taught Chris to whisper black out of respect for blacks? Me. <laughs> Keith puts up with so much for me. <laughs> That's good. My well, goal, John, if I've never told you this, starting this show was to get him to fall out of his chair during a show live. 
laughing. I just, I just enjoy doing that. Just saying completely inappropriate things, messed up things. Knowing his, his Keith, family. Keith watching. is actually wearing a seatbelt, so he can't fall out. <laughs> yeah, keeps him in the seat. <laughs> but I love it when he falls asleep and starts to. Smoke. Oh my god! Yeah, because let me tell you something about this guy. He works all night and then stays up to do these shows and then sleeps afterward. And I feel so bad for him that I often don't, won't bother him in the morning to join us because I want him to get some sleep. But absolutely, there's an ongoing game of who can catch Keith sleeping on the show. <laughs> don't get uh-huh. mad. No, there, there's no, no, no such no, no, game. No, no. There is no such game. No. But my dedication to, to, to what we do and how we do it and the fans that we've made, I mean, yep. you know, it keeps me coming back and want to do the best that I can. So, you know. Oh, that's and great. you do, buddy. You do. Yep. Keith is uh, God, man. I I do, and I mean this. I look forward to when you retire. So I know you'll still have to do something because retirement's going to be all that great. But it'll be nice to have <laughs> more. He's doing something else. And I I know I sound just like Mel <laughs> when I say this. His wife. Uh, it'll be nice to see a little more of you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I think when she says it, she means something else. Uh- <laughs> I hope she means something else. <laughs> I, I'll, mention, I'll mention, Keith, you know, you are part of the black community. And I, I was dating a lovely black woman, one of several I've dated. And well, wait a minute. She, How do I you asked know her, he's part of the black community. Uh, I probably, he probably knows I have my Oh, card. no, no, no. He's a, he's a white nerd. He's wearing a filter. It's the flag. <laughs> it's the flag on your hat. That's, that's what, that's what cued me off. Now, so anyway, so I asked her one day, you know, I said, uh, you know, why isn't the black community more interested in the space program? Cause I was, a, I've always been a space cadet. And she just said, oh, we don't think that far ahead. She says, we just think. We're focused on the here and now all the time. She said, well, I don't know. Could you, is, is that, that was several years ago. Mm-hmm. So what, what do you think is the attitude, right? You know, like when I show that, oh, this big thing happened on Mars, we should go to Mars. What is the reaction of the black community to something like that? It, it It's about like any other community. I mean, for those of us that are big space nerds, you know, seeing someone like Mae Jameson go up or, or Guy. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, we're inspired and we want to see more. And and given the participation of Nichelle Nichols post Star Trek. Oh, what she was attempting to do and bringing in more women and more minorities into the space program. That's definitely something that, that, that did have a tremendous effect. But then again, I did meet her. I did meet her once and, She's a screamer, not a groaner. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, I never did. I never did have the pleasure of meeting her. And I, honor me. even when I met her, and and this was only a few years back. I mean, she she had there was just something about her. Oh, it's just I saw her amazing. Now. And uh, again, I I I had to tell her it's like. Uh, and I'm sure I'm not the first person to have ever told her that, but it's like, I, I just, any thoughts of going to space, I told her was because of you. <laughs> I, 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 I just found. And can I have your phone number? <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife was standing there. So oh, that would have, okay. that would have been there better. you go. There just, you go. You slipped her a napkin is what you did. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I gotta, I'll just, you know, I just, I just going to, uh, mentioned one other thing, the uh, Bolden, who was you know General Bolden, who was also a former uh, black astronaut mm-hmm. on the shuttle. He ended up being in charge of NASA. He said going to Mars is essential to our survival. Get your ass and to Mars. Get your ass to Mars. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, my own understanding was he was told to shush up. You know, don't. Oh, really? Don't say why it's essential to our survival, but you know, just like everything else in this country, so much is obscured. Yeah, and um, it's just like it's like the the galaxy 
spins because of dark matter. And nobody can figure out what it is, but it makes everything move. It's just like Washington, D.C. What are you talking about? I have a cup of it every morning. <laughs> <laughs> Cleans me out every day. Oh, um, I'll tell you. Hey, I, I want to go to oh. the chat for a couple of things. First, uh, welcome Master Players and, and uh, Master Players Radio and Television Plus Gaming. Um, welcome back. Good to see you. Glad you subbed. Yeah, some crazy stuff. Um, you're dealing with a bunch of silly... I mean, we always say it. Welcome to ADD Theater. We're gonna we're gonna have some fun. That's what we're doing. We're having fun. Talking I know about this nerd stuff, stuff is crazy ass, but it's the truth. It is true, as far as um, I know. Of it. Exactly. And thank you for becoming uh, a member. Very, very kind of you. And once again, well, every Wednesday on the morning show, UFO Wednesdays, uh, the gift from us to you is you get to join us in the after show and talk with uh, Don. And any guest that joins us that show. And uh, it's something that we want to show our appreciation to you guys and um, and gals. I, I don't differentiate. Guys means girls to me, too. But uh, also in the chat, first of all, um, I do want to say that uh, Brian is here. Pop Culture Minefield. Gary, you are welcome to enter Canada by the back door at any time. Brian, <laughs> um, you're a filthy bastard. Lucky you. He's from Scotland originally. He's a, a wee Canadian now. <laughs> uh, thank you, buddy. I appreciate it, man. I love you. Uh, oh, for you. Just wanted I to mean, mention, you... mention oh. one interesting thing to keep. I saw this interview between Nichelle Nichols, mm -hmm. and uh, she was, and she talked about she wanted to quit the show. She says, "I'm nothing but a glorified telephone operator." Yes. As I thought, oh no. She, she completely underestimated her impact. She's completely. a deck officer. But she she but she said that she had dinner with Martin Luther King and he said, "Oh no, by request." <laughs> by request. I just I I request you stay on this what an incredible conversation and encounter. Well, tonight. you also have to think of the reach of people of color at that time period by 1966 yes. <clears throat> you probably only had one other television show that featured anyone of color in in a leading role and i think that was i spy with yeah with bill, cosby. bill cosby bill cosby and um you you didn't see very much else uh and and I think for Dr. King, it was just important to actually see people out there oh, doing the was, job. She was very than, visible. Oh, yeah. But I mean, that, that's the Especially portion. Especially those that, net stockings she wore. Oh, jeez. Uh, yes, gosh. Uh, and, but uh, once again, it's important to remember she was an actual uh, officer in command mm -hmm. uh, yes. of her position. Yes, she was. And that was, I mean, how you couldn't understand how important that was, I don't know. She yeah. missed that mark, and, and I'm glad that Martha, Martin Luther King noticed it and said something to her, because yeah. oh, I yeah. think it would have been a horrible loss. Oh, but it would have been With that said, loss. I want to play this, this video real quick for both Christian DeLorme for, again, a $5 super chat, Canadian. In the War of 1812, tell your Yankee subs why you guys call it the White House. Because oh, they burned it up. They burned that... Damn. <laughs> um, they they sat down. The British and Canadian troops sat down and had a. They they found a banquet all set up in the White House, and they made rude toasts to the pictures of Dolly <laughs> Madison on the wall. Yeah, I, <laughs> I tell you, know man. That. Uh, for that super chat, you get this very simple video. Fuck. <laughs> there you go. And for um, seventy show for your um. Uh, back door breakage. Then get your ass to Wouldn't you know that back door would trigger a trap door? Yeah, and look where we landed. <laughs> In the back door. Okay. And um, 70s has another. Oh, you show. son of a bitch. Uh, Brian with $5 Canadian because he's up there in Alberta. Uh, Christian and I are getting ready to invade the U.S. with our. Oh, my God. I love poutine. Mortar poutine. Maple. I will eat. Uh, Fat Steven Seagal, a good friend of mine, that's uh, our Don. I happen to know that I happen to know that we were invading Canada in 1812 for the poutine. Yeah, <laughs> French fries, gravy, 
and cheese curds. Oh, absolutely. I was told about this. I went, oh, it can't be all that good. Then I Mm, ate it and I went, mm -hmm. don't forget the Molson beer. Oh, (laughs) well, I I was more, I liked uh, Moosehead personally. Um, Molson's was good, but I always liked Moosehead. The problem with Molson's for me was uh, they use green bottles up there for some reason. And every time I got it, it was um, skunky, you know, because the green bottles allow ultraviolet light in. And it, it turns beer skunky. But Moosehead, we got it quicker, I guess. I never got that experience with that. It's a true experience. If you've ever had it, it's gross. When you go to drink a beer and you smell sulfur and it's like, tastes funny, but you're like, it's still beer. And you drink it. Because <clears throat> it's cardinal sin. You never pour out a beer. And uh, for your thank you video, this one's just for you, Brian. Absolutely for you. What do they teach you to talk like this in some Panama City sailor want a hump hump bar? Sell crazy someplace else. We're all stocked up here. <laughs> Good old Jack. Uh, uh, what Lorthos says, if and it's not, oh yeah, if it's not Scottish, it's crap. <laughs> <laughs> and Christian Delorme. Are we going to get to do any more of the show? You guys are throwing (laughs) super jets at me. Uh, I love you, 70s. You're a gem. Yes, he really is. Um, I think what broke my heart this week, because I talked to Anima about it, is that my schedule is so tight that I, you know, I have to quit doing his show on Mondays when he does his Monday shows. Oh, it's Anima, not Anima. I kept. (laughs) Yeah, her real name is Danny, but um, uh, we call, we all call her Anima. And it's from, it's from the Latin anima confusa, uh, also Jungian psychology. Um, love you seventies. You're a gym. Thank you. And for you. Oh my God. Okay. Here's this video. This evening is ruined. Look at, wait, what? This evening is ruined. The whole evening is ruined. Why are you saying it like that? Saying what? I'm just pointing out the party's ruined. You know what? I'm not going to get sucked into this. (laughs) There you go. And, uh, phrasing (laughs) sucked into this. Okay. Um, so Nichelle said that was an absolute true story. Yeah. Um, I do want to go back and uh, talk about something that as much as I love all of the secondary cast from Star Trek, um, Keith and I are absolute defenders of William Shatner, that all the negative hype that you have heard was because while they were getting to do, because they were day workers, they weren't stars. They, no. they, they even on Star Trek, there were episodes when they weren't there because they'd already worked their hours and couldn't work anymore. Um, for them to throw so much shade at the star of the show. Well, it's George Sakai. Him and, him and Shatner obviously got Well, technically it was all of them. All of them got into oh. it. In fact, on Raw Nerve, I love the fact that Shatner, it was a show that he, he had on... What was it? IFC? What, but not Nichelle Nichols. I never heard her. Say no, anything. Nichelle Nichols didn't. But um, never said any bad about. Uh, well, she's. I don't know. I think I've heard some things from her too. Um, but I have to say that all of this was started during the con circuit, and he was working in Hollywood while they were doing the con circuit. Ah, you see, so yeah, they got but, ahead of of the uh, narrative, post- and they created this narrative of him yeah. being a shit heel and. All this stuff, and that's where it all got started. Yeah, it, it, was, it was post series, so from 1969 to about 1975, uh, uh, there was this whole thing where the other cast members were doing all the cons, and Shatner was working his ass off because he had gotten a divorce, and he had three, he had his ex wife and three daughters to support. Yes. So during that period, he pretty much was living out of his truck. Trying Which to take leads any... led to an amazing story that yeah. was in a, a news article I read many years ago, where a little boy saw Shatner, and I think he was uh, putting away his fishing rod, mm-hmm. and he was sitting on the back stoop of a camper shell on the back of a pickup truck, and that's what he was living in, making sure that his kids and his wife were taken care of. That's how yes. he lived. And this kid walked up to him and he says, "Aren't you Captain Kirk?" And Shatner. Just quick, clearly loves kids and loved the fans. He leaned at him and goes, I'm on a way mission. <laughs> <laughs> and that kid's life was made, you know, from yeah. that little moment. My uh, ex met Shatner. She was living up in uh, Mexico, Missouri. And uh, she was walking home 
I think she was about seven or eight. And there's Shatner there at this place where they were, they were selling horses. And he was there to buy a horse. And so he was walking a horse and she was walking along with him on the other side of the fence. And they struck up a conversation. She, they talked all the way around the block. And then she waved by to him, left, and then later learned that was William Shatner. And then she told me, I didn't know who he was. And that's why we broke up. <laughs> I'm, <just kidding. laughs> I'm like, I can't, oh, Jerry, I can't be know. with you. I can't. <laughs> but somebody um, has been through the mill twice. I, I have your deepest, I have deepest sympathy for you. <laughs> I am. I used to be referred to as a, uh, a professional breaker upper. I got so good at it that my last uh, one I married. Okay, son, it, you butterfly too much. You butterfly <laughs> too much. You flutter by. Um, I left the. I moved out it, when they came back from Florida from a vacation. I was leaving with my U-Haul and I left the divorce papers on the door. I never had to talk to her again. That's how efficient I am at it. <laughs> I'm a pro. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, all you guys for being here today. Um, sure. Great. Uh, how are we doing on time? We got what? 15 minutes, minutes left. 15? 15 minutes. Oh, I didn't realize. That. I thought we were closer to the top. Okay. So, um, hey, Keto Simple is here. Dustin, good to see you. Anybody else? Mar Did I see Marco jump in? Oh, yeah. There's a, a Marco jumped in. People. Yeah. I said hello to all these others, but Keto Simple and Marco, I missed. Uh, good afternoon. Glad you joined us. Um, if there's any questions you want to ask John Brandenburg about rocket science, uh, what it takes to be one, um, did you, how did you get into that? Was that like collecting cereal box things that you had to cut out to become a doctor? No, you had, <laughs> <laughs> no, I had to, uh, work very hard as a graduate student. Where'd you go Lawrence, to school? Lawrence Livermore National Lab. I went to a graduate school called Teller Tech. I went to school. I went, got my bachelor's degree at Southern Oregon University in Oregon, and then went south to um, California to work at uh, a place called Teller Tech. It was a, well, it was a graduate school set up at Lawrence Livermore National and Lab. And that's where you got where they built, PhD. Yeah, they, they built hydrogen bombs at one end of the lab. At the other end of the lab, they were trying to harness fusion energy. So that's what I worked on. Uh, but... Um, at various pro times, I was actually down near the weapons end, and I worked down the hall from like the people who invented the neutron bomb, and they oh. were so pleased with it. Oh, you remember that? Yeah, the clean oh. bomb leaves oh, everything oh, standing oh. and just destroys all life. <laughs> we're standing there. I'm just this graduate, punky graduate student, which is the lowest form of human life, and I'm standing there by the coffee machine, you know, drinking my coffee, and this guy comes up, and he says, you know, we've invented this neutron bomb. And it's really neat because it it only kills the people. It leaves all the valuable stuff <laughs> intact: the factories, the bridges, the ro ro roads, and everything. What's good? And is I'm I'm pretending dead. to nod. Hey, get, I'm pretending get. to nod by drinking my coffee and kind of you know. Yeah. And then and then finally, I built up my courage and I said, "Well, you know, the the neutron bomb is supposed to be clean and tidy, and only kills people, but." Uh, suppose the Russia, if we launched that at the Russian tanks coming over the border of West Germany, which was the big nightmare in those days, then uh, won't the Russians respond with their very dirty and crude nuclear weapons in response? And he says, oh, oh, no, 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 they won't do that. <laughs> and I yeah. thought, this is profound bullshit. This is not even your regular run of the mill bullshit. But I, you know, I, I just, as I said, I pretended to be nodding while I was drinking my coffee. And, right. Uh, I sure, heard so yeah, many, whatever. Uh, I heard so many strange conversations there. Like they told me in 1975 when I first started there as a graduate student, bottom of the total pole, these computing science people, we shared the building with them. They were the computing science and they built the first good chip computers. And they were all about AI, even in those days. And they said, John, we're going to make these intelligence computers. This is 1975, they tell me this. They said, we're going to make these intelligence computers. The human race will be obsolete by 1980 and extinct by the year 2000. We're going to replace it entirely with machines. Wouldn't that be marvelous? And I... Is this I, what you said? I, I'm curious, John. Is this what you said? Well, whatever helps you sleep at night, bitch. 
<laughs> no, I uh, very mindful of being on the bottom of the totem pole there. I I finally built up my courage. Sounds great. Made, <laughs> said to, I said to one guy, I said, well, these new computers are going to be really smart, smarter than a human being, right? And he says, yeah. And I said, well, the whales are smart. Why aren't they rich? <laughs> and and he, he looked at me like, oh, oh, my God. I thought you were one of us, John. I thought you were on board. You don't you get it. You don't me, get it. Hand him a can opener and tell him to open a can of food. Then a computer might impress me. <laughs> I well, I I actually the the terminate the movie Terminator came out shortly after that, and it was because there was it, it was California. There was a lot of talk like that about you know computers taking over and uh, replacing. Oh, and by well, the that's way, what War people, Games was about too. These people think they're going to be uploaded into the computer and have eternal life. Oh, yeah, you're, they you're, do. You're so. I know, Keith. I know spirit. you're looking. You're looking like, oh no, that's Brandenburg. It's just, it's just. Oh no, 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 no. I know you're saying, but what they're actually thinking? I mean, they do realize I know. this is like some lunatic cult, like the Hale Bop Comet, you know, Heaven's Gate characters, and you, you know, no computer. It's, as soon as it runs short of memory, it's going to start erasing. Yes. Whatever. <laughs> Sorry, hey, need we, more memory space. We have and, a uh, question for you, John. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from Das Walfen. Uh He says, how close are we to Cold Fusion? Oh, I think we're still quite far away. I, I'm a hot fusion Do you guy. think it's that they're not putting enough research into it? That they can't find a way to make money off it, so why do it? Well, the problem with Cold Fusion is it's cold. If somebody melts down something, then I'll be impressed. But you know, you can't. You you can't. It's it's good enough that they're getting good enough results to heat bath water, and that that could be valuable. But we don't. Uh, they don't have a theory. They don't have. It's just very frustrating. Uh, I went to a cold fusion conference, and they're they're making progress but they're still nowhere near in a basic explanation of why this effect you know the excess heat actually occurs and until they can have that and understood in detail like we do for hot fusion which occurs in the middle of the sun then um, unfortunately cold fusion is just going to be kind of a laboratory oddity i'm sorry i i would think since hot fusion works, that we ought to be just pouring all of our resources into that. And, uh, and you know, I have my own uh, project called the Texatron, which hopes to well, get a short We're going to need to get you run. back on again, John, because we got to wrap. Uh, sadly, we have reached the end of the show. Okay. Um, John, thanks for coming. You got to come back, man. I like having you. Oh on. yeah, I'll be, I'll be back. Don't You're worry. You guys try to try keep with, me dude. away. I'll be hanging around your back door. <laughs> oh! oh! No video. No, not not the way you think. Not the way you think. <laughs> I, but I'll be. Uh, yeah, no, I'll be around the neighborhood. I'll be in the neighborhood. You'll see You'll me be down in the, neighborhood. the corner. Uh, Chanel, Our doctor can, and call. You can play. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, I am a for being here. Second episode. A happy, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Yes, Keith, no shows thank you so tomorrow. much for joining us. No shows. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody.